Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We extend a special welcome to you. We're trying to track attendance again, and uh, so if, if, if you would fill out an attendance card, both members and visitors alike, then uh, after you filled those out, you can pass them to the outside aisles, and they'll be collected by our ushers in a few minutes. We have several on our sick list. Uh, Gloria Stone has moved to Walnut Creek in Evansville for rehab. John West is at home but still having trouble and will be having more tests done. Carol Cummings is home from the hospital and improving. Uh, some friends of Emily Terry's, Todd and Janet Batchelor, are in the hospital with COVID and Todd is in serious condition. Mark Klein, the nephew of Marlena Buchanan, is very sick with COVID. And our deepest sympathy is extended to Sherry Rashidi and on the loss of her brother, Tony Leatherman. Some upcoming activities. Youth group will meet at Josh and Emily's home for the breakfast club on Saturday at 10. Uh, we're going to be starting a ladies class on Tuesday morning. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby if you plan to uh, attend that and they need to know how many books to order. So that'll be a uh, Tuesday morning at 10 class for the ladies. High school youth group will be going on a camping trip to Patoka Lake. That is September the 10th through the 12th. And you can see Josh uh, or Emily for those details. This morning, leading us in our worship service, uh, Juan Nunez will lead our opening prayer. Song leader will be Jesse Tapp. Uh, Lord's Supper devotional by Bob McIndoo. Billy Ray will read our scripture. Sermon by David Salisbury. And closing prayer by Bill Gridwell. Now let's all join as Jesse comes to lead our scene. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bow with me, please. Our gracious Holy Father, we again thank you for this day of worship that we're able to assemble together as Christians to give honor and glory to you for the blessings that you give us each and every day. During times of trials and tribulation, Lord, we, we, and we face challenges, we know we turn toward you. When we're weak, you give us strength. When we're down in despair, you give us hope. We pray, Lord, for the congregation, for all of us that are here, but also some that were mentioned in prayer list that are not able to be here because of sickness or upcoming surgery. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for those that are traveling. They may return safely. We pray that the message we hear this morning, Lord, that inspires us as Christians, but also, Lord, to be better disciples in our talents and our actions that we do out among our community and wherever we go, that, Lord, we continue that as we learn the words, it strengthens our faith each and every day. Forgive us of all our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. once this past week you almost certainly felt overwhelmed or inadequate you had at least one reason or circumstance to give up or give in something that made you feel like the world was winning and you were not good enough the Ephesians felt this same way and as I read Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verses 3 through 8 consider Paul's message and the words he had for them Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. That is, in Christ, he chose us before the world was made so that we would be his, only, his holy people. People without blame before him, because of his love, God had already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what he wanted and what pleased him and it brings praise to God because of his wonderful grace God gave that grace to us freely in Christ the one he loves in Christ we are set free by the blood of his death 
and so we have forgiveness of sins. How rich is God's grace, which, is, which he has given to us fully and freely. So as we gather around this symbolic supper table, we remember who we, we belong to and what he has done for us. Knowing Christ and how much he loves us should lift us up as nothing else can. As we take this symbolic meal that reminds all of us that Christ, what Christ did for us, remember these three things. You are chosen, you are loved, and you are free. Bow with me as we offer thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this memorial that you have set aside for us, and we're thankful that you have made us your chosen people. Father, we look back to the cross now and remember Christ and how he died for our sins. Father, we ask that this time as we partake of this bread that we do so in a manner to be pleasing to you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Bow with me as we remember Christ's blood. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again we come before you, thanking you for this time that we can remember your son who died for our, in, our sins. Father, we ask that to, as we partake of this cup, which represents Christ's blood, that we do so in a manner to be pleasing to you. That's these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, the Bible commands that we give money to the local church so that we continue the works that we do, and this church is very involved, and we ask that you consider that. Uh, we also have <clears throat> baskets in the back of the foyer as well as the back of the auditorium to make your offering. Uh, if you're watching online or you choose to, you can also give online. Bow with me now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability that you've given us that we can work and make money and support ourselves. Father, we're asking now that you be with each of us as we take a, some of what we've earned and give it to you and your church that this work here might continue on. Father, we're thankful for the men that oversee this money and we ask that you help us Spend this money wisely and do things that will make your church strong and bring others to you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise, headed for that jubilee yonder in the skies. What a day of singing, singing. what a day of shouting, shouting on that happy morning when we all shall gladly rise. What a day of glory, 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 hallelujah, glory, when we meet our blessed Savior. Sing, sing. 
Scripture reading this morning, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go for therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Thank you, Billy, for reading that. Thank you for being here this morning, man. It is great to be together. I am grateful for the opportunities we get to worship God together. I know we have several folks that are joining us online today, and we appreciate you doing that. And sure would invite you to be with us in person every chance that you get. Had a great weekend already. I want to say thanks to Micah and Jamie Busby for overseeing our EMS luncheon. That was a great success yesterday. And we that is one way that we just want to say thank you to folks in our community that are our servants and do a great job for us. And we appreciate the chance to tell them thank you and to provide lunch for them yesterday. Also want to say thanks to Chad McPherson for teaching for me Wednesday night. I was with the Critton and Drive congregation in Russellville. They send you the greetings. And I missed being here, but Chad did a great job. You know, for almost a thousand years, the world celebrated Ulrich of Augsburg Day. It was a feast day. If you grew up in the Catholic Church, and in that time just about everybody did, he was somebody of great importance. Ulrich of Augsburg in 993 was the first person ever to be made a saint by the Pope. And that was a huge deal. And so for 800 years, all anybody knew was the 4th of July is Ulrich of Augsburg Day. All around the world, the 4th of July was a festival for Ulrich of Augsburg. Then American independence happened and the 4th of July kind of got taken over. And not a lot of folks know about Ulrich of Augsburg in America. And on the 4th of July, you'll be hard-pressed to find him as more than just a footnote on a calendar in the calendar. But you know, that's not the first time a holiday got taken over. For centuries, the Jews celebrated a feast, the Feast of Shavuot. They celebrated Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai, a pretty important feast. And then in 33 AD, something miraculous happened. On the feast day of Shavuot, the apostles began to preach about Jesus. And as Peter preached that gospel sermon and offered an invitation there... Over 3,000 people eventually responded to it. The Jews called that day Shavuot, but in Greek, the name of that day was Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And from that point on, on that day in AD 33, 3,000 people were added to the church, and suddenly the day of Pentecost became more about the Christian church than Moses and the law. And ever since then, we've been working to be the church. And that's what we're talking about on Sunday mornings. How is it that we can be the church? We understand that it's our identity, that it's a 24-7 calling. It doesn't just mean showing up here on Sundays. We saw last week the word disciple is the best description for those of us who want to follow Jesus. And that describes a lifestyle that we lead. Jesus called us to be disciples. Now amongst those who wear the name disciple or Christian or claim to follow Jesus, we share a lot of common beliefs. 
We are opposed to the idea that you can take the body of Christ and cut it up into little different pieces. And even if you call those different pieces denominations, if they're different groups, then we're opposed to dividing the body of Christ. But amongst those who follow Jesus and, and wear that name, most all of us agree we come to God as sinners, doomed to face punishment for our action that is a just payment for what we have done in violating God's law. We agree that God loved us and sent Jesus to die for our sins. Most of us would agree that being a Christian involves a change in lifestyle. I live differently after I come to Jesus than I did before I came to Jesus. Living saved looks different from living lost. But one area where we have a lot of difference with a lot of other groups who might wear that name Christian is when it comes to the topic of baptism. Baptism wasn't new on the day of Pentecost. It had been around. The Jews had a baptism that they practiced. It was a self-baptism. If you wanted to become a Jew, to convert to Judaism, one of the last steps you made was to walk yourself down into a pool and immerse yourself under the water and come up out of that pool as a Jew. And it symbolized that you were a new creation in God. That was a familiar concept already. John the Baptist had already shown up on the scene by the day of Pentecost, and John had shown up, and when he showed up, he was just John. And then he did something nobody else had ever done in all of recorded history. Somebody baptized somebody else. That self-baptism had been around, but nobody ever baptized another person until John did. And so John became known as John the Baptizer, John the guy who will baptize you. Nobody else does that. And so he's known as John the Baptist. And John's baptism that he practiced was a sign of repentance. It's a sign of saying, I was wrong and I, I need to be washed from those sins. I want to turn my life around. And on the day of Pentecost, we read that 3,000 people were baptized. But something unique happened on Pentecost. As Peter preached and talked about baptism and 3,000 folks responded to it and were baptized, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now notice it, it happened at the same time there. Notice what it says. They were added to the church and they were saved. It, it's the same thing. And so for the next 1,500 years, the church taught that baptism and salvation are connected. And, and so for 1,500 years, they, they taught that baptism was the moment you entered the church. The moment of baptism was the moment that God added you to the church. It was the moment that you were saved, just like they read about on the day of Pentecost. And then Huldrych Zwingli came along. He was a Swedish preacher, and he said that baptism was an outward sign of a change that had already happened on the inside. It was a sign for other people. It didn't actually do anything to you. It just identified you with what you already were, a Christian. And so baptism became more about placing membership in a local congregation, a sign for the people around you, than it did about being saved from sin. So why is it that for 1,500 years, people believed that baptism and salvation were connected? It's because they read it in the Bible. It's the most straightforward way to understand what you read in the scriptures. It's not some new idea. Sometimes people look at us and they say, you guys have that weird newfangled teaching on baptism. It's actually really, really, really old. And the idea that, that you could be a Christian who hadn't been baptized is actually the new kid on the block. And so this morning, as we talk about being the church, and we're looking at these commands in Scripture of what we ought to be as Christians. We talked about be my disciple last week. I want you to hear this command, be baptized, but don't take my word for it. Because my opinion doesn't matter. But listen to the word of God and tell me how you would understand these verses. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You read those verses and you say, what did Peter tell them? He said, there's a promise. It's a promise for you and for your children. It's a promise for all time. And what is that promise? That you'll be forgiven of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what did Peter tell them to do? Repent and be baptized. And so if you read those verses and you say, I want to do what Peter said to do, because he said this is a promise for all of us, it's easy to see how the church understood that baptism and salvation were connected. 
In the Great Commission, the reading that Billy gave us this morning from Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He starts out by saying, I'm speaking on behalf of God. This is all authority. And then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Well, Jesus, how do we do that? He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, I'm setting something up that continues all the way until eternity begins. For the rest of time, this is how it's going to be. I want you to make disciples. You do that by baptizing and teaching. In fact, if you read that, it's impossible to say, well, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, but not be baptized. And that's what baptism is for. It's for the moment when someone says, I want to be saved. The word baptism means immersion. It means to dip, to dunk or immerse. It's referred to as a burial. And when you want to be baptized, you're immersed in water. It's important that you go under the water and come up out of the water. It's a symbolism of a burial. The New Testament example clearly speaks to baptism by immersion for all those who say, hey, I'd like to be a Christian. They're immersed in water. And that's their baptism. That's the moment they look to when they say, hey, that's when God added me to the church. That's when I was saved from my sins. So we know why we do it, because we read it in the Bible. We know how we do it. It's by immersion. But when do we do it? In Acts chapter 8, and a great place, by the way, to go and read these examples is the book of Acts, to look at all these folks who say, I want to be a Christian, and here's what the first century church taught them to do. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is studying with a eunuch from Ethiopia, and it says in verse 35 that Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at that very scripture, he was reading from the Old Testament, he preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Literally, he says, what's in the way? What's between me and baptism? As Philip has preached Jesus to him, he's come to understand, here's what I need to do. And, and he's asking this question. Now, look, is there anything else I need to know? Is there anything else I need to do? What would hinder me from being baptized? In verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And notice what happens next, verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. The eunuch says, well, let's stop right here, right now. When, when he says, what hinders me, Philip does, nothing hinders you. But notice Philip doesn't say, well, you know, if you believe you're good. He doesn't say, if you want to be baptized, let's wait till you get home and we'll find a good pool and a good place. Maybe you can wait till, you know, all your family's around. Instead, they stopped right there. You can almost see the eunuch as soon as Philip says, if you believe you can, he says, whoa, stop. Let's take care of this right here and right now. In Acts chapter 16, it's the middle of the night. Paul and Silas have been thrown in jail, and they've ended up in a Bible study with the jailer. They were beaten and locked in jail, and God did an amazing miracle. You should read the story. It's Acts 16. The jailer thinks he's going to die. He thinks it's all over, and he ends up not dying. Instead, he ends up talking with Paul and Silas because he says, you guys have something that I need. And he asks this question. What must I do to be saved? He looks at them and he says, you guys have a salvation that I need. I realize I'm not saved and I want to be. What must I do to be saved? And in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 31, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your household say, all right, that's all I got to do is believe. Verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Notice what they told him to do. You need to believe with all your heart. At the end, he says, man, I am so glad that I believed in God. And what did he do in the middle? It says he got baptized. It says that he understood what Paul and Silas taught him about salvation, about being saved. He knew right here in the middle of the night with two guys who needed some medical attention, I need to be baptized. And so they went and they took care of it. They didn't wait till the next day. They did it that very hour. In fact, it's an amazing little fact that every conversion in the book of Acts, the people are baptized after just one lesson. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, in several years of doing this, that doesn't always happen. But in the book of Acts, you run into people who have a background and knowledge of God and the Scripture, and after one lesson, they're convinced enough to be baptized. They don't know the answer to every question, but they know enough to be baptized. There's something so central about baptism that it's in the very first lesson that every preacher, every teacher presents to share the gospel. And apparently sharing the gospel meant convincing them, here's what you need to do to be saved and do it quickly. Again, they didn't know everything, but they knew enough to be baptized. So as we talk about being baptized this morning, there is one really important thing that that I need you to hear me say, all right? We are saved by grace through faith, not by works. We have a baptistry at this church. It's right back here behind this screen. The water in it is H2O. There's nothing magical about it. We don't say any magic word at your baptism. There's nothing sacred about it. If you'd like to get baptized in some different water, that's just fine. There's nothing sacred about the person who does the baptizing because the water isn't what saves us. The grace of God, because of what Jesus did on the cross is how we're saved. And there is no way that being immersed underwater could earn your salvation. Paul says, I want to be clear. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. When we accept God's offer of grace, we put on Christ in baptism. When we accept his offer, his invitation to be saved, we don't deserve it any more than anybody else. But when we accept it, we accept the terms with it. So if he says, here's a gift I'd like to give you, and here's what I want you to do to receive it. We don't earn it by doing that. We simply receive it. So I want to be really clear as we talk about baptism. While baptism and salvation are clearly connected in Scripture, you can't separate the two. Nobody would ever say that we somehow earn our salvation by working for it in the baptistry. But this morning, I want to make this really personal and and kind of simple, okay? Because I think sometimes it gets really complicated. We live in a time when a whole lot of folks are trying to convince you that you need to do something to be safe. That, that you know what, if you will go out there, and most of the time we're talking about, if you'll go out there and you'll get a shot, you'll be safe. They say there's something out there and it's dangerous. And it might even kill you. And there's something else out there that may well save you. And I'm not here to take a stand on vaccines or shots or become part of that discussion in a political way at all. We can talk about that privately if you want. But whether you got the shot in the arm or whether you didn't, the decision you've made is one of trust. If you decide to get the vaccine, it's because, you know what, I trust, take your pick. Maybe you say, you know what, I trust the CDC and I trust the WHO and, and, and I trust the drug companies and I trust the research. In fact, isn't that the phrase that we use a lot of times? Oh, I trust the science, right? At its heart, this is an issue of trust. Maybe it's not those big name folks that you don't know. Maybe you called your doctor or maybe you called some friends and you said, what do you think? And, and together you guys talked about it. You said, these are people I trust who know about this. And you made a decision Because you trusted those folks. At its heart, this issue is an issue of trust. Everybody believes there's truth and there's lies. Now, we may disagree about what the truth and the lie is, but everybody believes there's truth and there's lies, and they want to follow the truth. And everybody believes your health and maybe even your life is on the line with this decision that you make about a vaccine. So let me take an issue that we're all really familiar with, that we're all wrestling with. Most of us have made some type of a decision, an informed decision already, one way or the other. And let me make an argument from the lesser to the greater, if I could. You see, you may or may not face COVID one day. There's no guarantee that you'll get it, but you will face God one day. It's a guarantee. You may not die from COVID, but if the Lord tarries, something will get you. If no disease ever comes your way, if no virus ever takes your life, you'll eventually die of birthday poisoning. Everybody does. This life has a 100% fatality rate. And we know for a fact that sin has a 100% infection rate. 
While we might say, well, I don't think I need to, to get a shot or I don't think I need to do, none of us would say, I don't think I need to be saved from my sins. None of us would say, I don't think I have any sins. You're here this morning. If you say, I believe in God, I believe in his word and his will, then you also would say, yeah, and I, I've messed up. Somewhere along the way, I've messed up. So if life has a 100% fatality rate, sin has a 100% infection rate, can I tell you that God's salvation has a 100% cure rate? It's a promise of God. It's a guarantee. There are no breakthrough cases. There are no failure rates. It is 100% effective every single time. So the only question left is, who do you trust? You see, it's a trust issue. And you can't really say, yeah, I trust God, but I'm not going to do what he said to do. Because that means you really don't trust him. If you trust him, and let's make this simple, all right? If you trust him, do what he says. Repent and be baptized. If you say, I trust the Lord to be saved, man, we can sort out the particulars later. For centuries, people came and they said, I think God is right and I want to be saved. And the church said, repent and be baptized. And they said, I got questions, but you know what? We'll study those after I get baptized. We'll study those after I answer my greatest need, which is to be saved from my sin. Maybe today you'd say, man, I got questions. I got baptized as a baby and I'm not sure what all that means, but I know I didn't make any decisions. I didn't decide to get baptized. I didn't repent of my sins. I was a baby. And I'm glad my parents made that choice. But it's time I make a choice. Uh, maybe you'd say, well, what about my parents? What about my family? There's some other folks who believe differently. And if I get baptized, what am I saying about them? Today, it's about you and what God has said for you to do. And you know what? If you come to a knowledge of the truth, you can share that with them. And what you do impacts you not anybody else. Or maybe you say, David, I prayed a prayer. Man, I asked Jesus into my heart. There was a preacher that told me to do that. And, and I've been living trying to follow God. And, and are you saying none of that counts for anything? Not at all. I am so thankful your heart was softened to the Lord. I'm so thankful that you realized life had to change. And today, if you would say, man, I listen to the Lord. I follow the Lord. And he says, repent and be baptized. Do you trust him? In just a moment, we'll sing an invitation song. This morning, if you're not a Christian, this morning, if you've never been baptized, if you look at your life and say, you know what? I think if I want to be the church, I need to be baptized. Man, don't wait. You can make that right this morning. We'd love nothing more than to baptize you this morning. And if you've got questions... By all means, we'll study those. And if you say, hey, I'm not ready to make that commitment yet, but I'd like to study some more, we'd love to do that as well. But this morning, if you're ready to repent of your sins and confess your faith and be baptized, have those sins washed away, we'd love to celebrate with you. And maybe this morning you're a child of God. And as we talk about baptism, you say, yeah, I did that. But as we talk about a lifestyle, you say, but I haven't lived that. This morning, if you need to come to the Lord or come back to him, we'd love to celebrate with you. Why don't you come right now as we stand and sing?
Father, as we humbly bow before you this morning, we want to thank you for all that you have blessed us with upon this earth, Father, and we, we thank you for this avenue of prayer that we have to speak directly with you. Father, we, we want to offer our thanks this morning for the, all that you have blessed us with upon this earth, and we understand that everything that we have, uh, our homes, our families, Father, and this, this church we have is through your blessing. Father, we ask you to continue to be with this nation as we fight this pandemic, and we ask that you be with the, the leaders of this nation as, uh, to bring them back to uh, a, a God-fearing nation. And once again, Father, we're, we ask you continue to be with the elders and the deacons of this church and as they help guide us. And we want to thank you for your son Jesus and the decision he made to depart heaven to come up here on this earth so that we may have an opportunity of everlasting life. Father, we ask as we depart here today that we will, we will take this lesson and as we begin our work week, we will, we will continue to be examples to those around us. Uh, we will to continue to encourage those around us. Uh, we ask that you, you be with those this morning that was mentioned as sick. We ask you to restore their health. We ask you to be with those who are not here with us for whatever reason, to bring them back. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.